Well, good morning. Good to see you this morning. How's everybody? Turned cold on us, didn't it? I figured it might since it's January. It'll be warm before we know it again, so it's good, it's good. Glad you're here with us this morning. How, how many of you are glad to be in a warm place and not outside sitting down? Okay, it's unanimous. Good, well, let me say a word of prayer, and uh, we'll do a welcome. We'll, we'll uh, jump into it today. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we come to you this morning, and we thank you so much uh, that we know you're here. Lord, in that... Uh, Lord, you want to meet with us today, and, and so we just ask that in this time, God, that you'd speak to our hearts, God, that you'll break our heart for what breaks your heart. Lord, move us, and we pray this in your name, amen. Well, again, uh, just a couple announcements. Uh, tonight, we're going to start a new study called Love and Respect, and, and uh, you'll there's a little bit of a discussion here about what that is. Um, it, it's actually, it is for, for marriage, and it's a, it's a marriage study. You may know someone that would need that. Even if you've been married for 70 years, there's still things you can learn. And, uh, and so you, you may learn something here that would, that would be great for your marriage. I know uh, we've got lots and lots of people that, um, have, that there are testimonies about love and respect and how it's helped their marriage. So... Um, love for you to come be a part. If uh, you say, well, Joe, that doesn't really fit my needs. Uh, we're going to also have a, uh, a prayer meeting going too. Uh, the Joanne uh, Dunn is going to, Martin is going to uh, lead. So if you'd like to do that instead and pray for the church, that'd be great too. So we'll have both of those going on simultaneously. Uh, you'll also notice we got a couple other things. Speaking of prayer, we got the, the Tuesday morning reset. Um, I was excited this past week. We had 10 people there. For it. So we, we, that was, a, it was good, and we're planning on having more next time. Yep, starts with one, now we go into two. And so that'll be from 6.30 to 7.30 if you'd like to come Tuesday morning. Uh, Wednesday night we've got our classes going, and you can see a list of them there. Um, now, at this time, if you would, would you stand, and let's greet those right around us, tell them they're Tell you, you're glad to see him this morning. Thank you. 
remain standing as we sing hymn number 197. We don't sing this very often. Rejoice the Lord is King.
25, he keeps me singing in my heart. <coughs> There's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still, in all of life's ebb and flow. Seven. Praise him, praise him. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O oh, earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Praise Him, 
pray together. Heavenly Fathers, we come at this time. We're so thankful for the message and song, the beautiful words that we hear sung and, and how it can touch our hearts and lives today. And we pray, Father, as a church that we'll be open and receptive to seeing issues around us today, reaching out to others and to bring people into our church so that they can come to know you as their Lord and Savior. We ask you now, Father, to be with the pastor as he brings the message. We ask you to blessings on these offerings that may use them to help us move forward. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, well, good morning again. Good to see you. Let's do this. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll, we'll jump into what we're going to talk about. Lord, we come to you this morning, and we just ask that you speak. Lord, I pray that we go out of here sad, glad, or mad, but not indifferent, Lord. God, help us um, as, as uh, we, we walk through your word today. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Well, again, good morning. Glad you're here. As we get ready to start, we're going to, today we're going to start talking about a subject I think is very important, probably to any church. We're going to talk about sharing our faith. Um, and I want to deal with that for the next few weeks. And I want to begin today by talking about getting our theology right on it. Um, and really, that's just our thinking needs to match what God says about reality. That's what theology really is. Um, and so uh, we want to talk about today kind of really our thinking about why it is we should evangelize, what God says about it, and so forth. And let me start it like this. Several years ago now, I was going to the hospital in Pensacola. And uh, we live kind of close to there, and uh, a lot of folks went to the hospital there. And so I went down to the hospital in Pensacola, and I was going to make a visit to someone that was in the hospital. And I wasn't real familiar with this hospital. It's kind of like St. Louis. You know how St. Louis has several different hospitals? You know, and it depends on which one you're going to. And so I wasn't real familiar with this hospital. And so I pull into the hospital, and they have this huge parking garage. And so I thought, okay, cool. So I get up and I, you know, park my car in the, in the parking garage and I'm getting ready to walk in to go see the person. And I look and, and I notice that it says like level two green or something like that. You know what I'm talking about? There's, they always have levels and then they always have a color and you know what, which one you're on. So I looked and pretty sure it said green and level two. So that's about, and I looked, I was about halfway down. I knew that. So I walk in. And I make the visit and, and pray with the person. And then I'm coming back out to my car. And so I get to the, the stairs and I say, well, I was on the second level. So I climb up stairs, get to the second level. And um, I walk out to where I think my car was on the second level. And I get there. There's no car. It's like, well, wait a minute. Okay, so it's the second level, green. All right, so then I walk over to about halfway through, and I look, still, can't find my car. It's like, what in the world? Did my car get raptured? What happened to my car? Someone stole it. So then I go, I'm getting a little bit frustrated, and I decide, well, I'm going to go downstairs and make sure, and I, I look, and I, so I go back down. It says parking garage this way, so I go, and same way, just like I thought I did when I came in. I go back up to second floor. And I'm looking for my car, no car. Now, by now, I'm starting to get a little, just a little more agitated. So I thought, you know what? I've got one of those, um, what do you call them, uh, keyless entry things, and I'll, I'll just press it, and I'll see. That'll make a beep or something, and I'll, I'll find my car. So I did that. You know, go, doot, doot. nothing. It's like, what? So then... I say, wait, wait a minute, I've got the panic button, I'm going to hit it. So I hit the panic button, not a sound. Now I'm starting to really think somebody has taken my car. And this was before, by the way, um, cell phones, you had the bag phone. Everybody remember the bag phone? That's what I had. So it was in the car with wherever my car was uh, hijacked to. So I'm sitting there going, okay, I, this is strange, never had this happen. So... I start thinking about it calmly, looking around. I go up to the third level just in case I messed up to see if it was up there. Still nothing. So now I'm thinking, it really did get stolen. Can't, I never had that happen. So I go down to the, the um, information. I broke down and went to the information desk, and I said, man, I think my car is stolen. And she looked at me, and she said, well, sir, before you get too stirred up, she said, look in the other parking garage first. <laughs> and I was like, I think I know where I parked. I don't need some stupid lady to tell me where I parked. So I went over to the second 
the other one where she told me to go. I walked up to the second floor, the, the second level, green, went about halfway over, pressed my button, and voila, there was my car. Someone had moved my car from this other parking garage over to this one. Right? Um, now, I quietly got in my car. I didn't go back and tell, tell her thank you because I look like an idiot. And uh, I just kind of quietly got out of that place. You know, I was thinking about that whole situation. And, you know, I thought I knew where I was. But I was really lost. I didn't know where I was. It was an odd feeling. And now we've all had the feeling of being lost. I don't know if you, somewhere in your life, you've probably had that helpless feeling where you don't know where you're going. I don't know if you've ever had, hopefully you, you probably have. Um, in fact, I was thinking this, most of the time my wife knows that I'm lost before I do. Now with GPS, it makes it a little bit better, but before that, you know. So we get lost in big cities. We get lost on back roads sometimes. We get lost in phone eternity. I can go on. We get lost in a lot of places. And we've all been lost before. And, and this morning, what I want to talk to you about, though, is I want to talk about another kind of loss. I'm not referring to where you physically can't find your way. I want to talk to you this morning about what the Bible says about lost. And the Bible says this, that, that people, people are lost. Um, what the Bible makes clear is there is a condition or a state that all humanity is in, and that is lost spiritually. Now, I want you to hear a verse of Scripture. This is Isaiah um, chapter 53, verse 6, and it says this. All us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way. The message, which is a, kind of a uh, paraphrase of the Bible, says it like this. We're all like sheep who've wandered off and gotten lost. We've all done our own thing and gone our own way. And basically, what the Bible says is this. Is it's kind of a sweeping statement about every person who's ever lived. We've all wandered off. We've all gotten lost from the path which goes to God. We, every, everybody. There's a right path, and none of us are on it. That's what the Scripture says. We're all lost. In fact, Romans 3.10 says it like this. Now, this may be offensive to somebody, but I'm just going to read it. This is the Bible. It says, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There's not even one. And the question is, okay, so like, how do we get off this path? How do we get off the path? And if you read down just a little further in Romans 3, verse 23, it says this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And what this says is that a person is lost because he sinned. Right? Um, Paul uses the word all here, and it's an indiscriminatory word. In other words, it means every rich person, every poor person, Every white person, every black person, every red person, every yellow, purple, you put the, every, um, every grandma, every grandpa, every Taco Bell worker, every king, every person living in a hut in Africa, every person, all, it says here that everybody has sinned. And here's what sin is according to the Bible. The Greek word harmatium just means to miss the mark. It means you're, you're it's like an... It's like an archer, and there's a target over here, let's say. And you're trying to shoot. You're trying to shoot and hit the target, and guess what? The Bible says that we've all missed the target. It means to miss the mark. That's what sin means. Um, and so what is the mark? The mark is perfection. The Bible says, and what Paul says here is that all have fallen short, right, of God's standard, and God's standard is perfection. Now, some of us think we're perfect, but we're not, right? No one's perfect. And most of us wouldn't, think, wouldn't say we're perfect. Um, so here's the Bible. The Bible says there is a sin barrier between a holy God and lost people, right? People are lost because, y'all, they're sinners. Now, there's something else about being lost. It's this. That's not the way it was supposed to be. Something that's lost 
is not where it's supposed to be. It's not in the place where it belongs, right? It's out of place. That is, it's not, it's not where it is supposed to be, and it's not, um, it's not where it was designed to be. Now, uh, so the lost thing, and, and actually Romans 3.10 says it becomes useless, the lost thing. And think about this for a second. It's, it's useless, the Bible says, the lost, a lost person, because it's not doing what it was designed to do. Right? Has anybody in here ever, have you ever lost anything? Anybody here? Have you ever? My son, I've got a middle son that loses everything. You hand him something and it's, he puts it down and then you don't know where it's at. Anybody do that? Well, here's the thing about when something is lost. Think about it. If you lose your keys, how good are those keys to you? How good are lost keys to you? And they're not because they were designed to get you in the door. And no matter how good they can get you in the door, if you don't have them, if they're lost, they're absolutely useless. Can I get a witness? Right? See, we were designed to be in a relationship with God. And that's, why, that's what we're created for. We're designed to worship God, to serve him. And when a person is lost, they're not doing and being what they were designed to be. And there's a sense of meaningless to their life. That's why you see people all over the place that go from thing to thing. How many of us, you look at a, um, like an actor or an actress. They got everything they could ever want. They got yachts, private planes, and their life is still meaningless because they're not being what they're designed to be. They're lost, right? And here's the other thing about being lost. If you're lost, there's little hope of arriving where you want to arrive, where you want to, where you want to go. You, you, you can't find it. And here's, here's the part of that. Most people are not looking for an eternal place where they can suffer for eternity, you know, anybody says, yeah, sign me up to, to eternally suffer. But here's, the Bible says, people who remain spiritually lost. And listen to me, there's church people that are lost. People who remain spiritually lost, right, will spend eternity in torment and hell. That's a reality. Here, here's what the Bible says. Jesus tells the story of two guys, one that knew God and the other didn't. And I want you to listen how he describes the place where the lost man goes. Here's what it says. This is Luke chapter 16, verse 19. It says, there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in the splendor of every day. A poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, and a longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now, the poor man died and was carried away to the by the angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, the rich man lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I'm in agony in this flame. And I just, I just bring this up to say this. Hades is a place where lost people go uh, that don't give their lives to Christ. Right? And it's a real place, y'all. This isn't a fairy tale. This isn't a game. It's a real place. It's a terrible place. And Jesus describes it as a place of torment. That's Hades. A place of agony. A place where God is not. A place where they'll be, people will be separated from God for eternity. And this is the eternal destiny of everyone that's lost. Right? Let me, get, let me put this into some perspective for you. Um, the, according to the North American Mission Board, a lot of y'all know what that is. That's our, that's our mission board that reaches North America for Christ. We've got a foreign one, and then we have a North American one. They say that 212 million people in the United States are lost. 212. And they say this, that that number is growing by 2 million every single year. Here's the question. Let me say this. Humanity is lost. Let me ask you, do you believe it? Do you believe it? The Bible says it is, that, that humanity is lost. Do you believe that people all around us are lost? Um, you say, yeah, Joe, the, 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 the guy that robbed the bank in New York, yeah, he's lost. 
and the, and the one that murdered somebody, he's lost. Yeah, those people are lost. What about the grandma, right, that baked you cookies or tucked you into bed? If she doesn't know Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior, the Bible says she's lost. Right? Now, people have a lot of, lot of really misconceptions about who's lost and who's not. The, you know, the Bible says all humanity. I, I have done a lot of my ministering to people in the South. Uh, people in the South think because they're from Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, or somewhere like that, they think because they're born in the South, well, they've been, they were born a Christian. That's just total hogwash. Sometimes people think, well, I, I look at the sign out front every, every time I go past it, so I must be a Christian. Or I come to church. I must be a Christian because I, I attend church. Listen, the essence of lostness is a life without a personal relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. That's it. I don't care if you sing in the choir, if you come to this church every week, that does not make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is a relationship with Jesus Christ. You say, well, Joe, I already know that. You're not telling me anything I know. Why are you talking about this? Because, listen to me, as a Christian, right, sometimes we forget that people are lost. That's why Paul brings it up in Ephesians, and I want to read this to you. Paul tells the, the Ephesians this. Remember back when you weren't a Christian. This, this is what he says. Paul, uh, Ephesians 2.12, listen to what it says. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from the citizenship among the people of Israel. And you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. See, the Ephesians are just like everybody. Everybody has lived at least at one time without Christ. They had no relationship with him. Um, they were living, they were breathing, they were doing life, but it was without a relationship with God. And listen to me, that's how you were at one time. And that's how I was at one time. Right? And, and that's how people all around us still are. And I'm here to, you know, kind of sound the alarm. Let me ask you something. Do you believe that people around us are really lost? The Bible says they are, but what are you? Are your neighbors are your, are your co-workers, are your coffee drinkers, are your siblings, are your sons, your daughters, your grandkids, are they really lost? Well, there's a second thing this morning that I want. So the first thing is this. The Bible says people are lost. Second thing is this. I want you to hear this because this is very, very important. God cares for lost people. God cares for for lost people. You know, um, the other day I was, uh, well, when I was studying for this, I, was, I uh, was reading a story about a pastor who, who um, was having a conversation with someone he knew was a Christian, and, he, and it kind of went like this. It was, Easter was coming up, and the conversation went like this. He asked the guy, he goes, hey, are you looking forward to Easter? It's coming up. And the man said, no, I'm not. As a matter of fact, I don't go to church on Easter. The pastor said, What? You don't go to church on Easter, you get arrested for that. You couldn't really, but yeah, you know. And so he said, I don't go to church on Easter because I can't stand all those creasters. You know those people that just come on Easter and Christmas? I don't like coming then. They, they, they come here and they just they get all dressed up and they wear a tie. And they, they put on perfume and they, they make an appearance and they mess everything up in the church. They mess up the parking lot. They mess up where I sit. Who do those people think they're fooling? They're not fooling God and they ain't fooling me, he says to the pastor. He says, this bothered me so much over the years, I just quit coming on Easter. I don't like it. I have no use for those people. The pastor said, although he, the guy didn't say this directly, what he basically was saying, not only does this guy not care you know, about, about people or have no use for people at Easter, he thinks that probably God doesn't either. And, you know, as I thought about this, I was thinking about what that guy said. And, and sometimes, you know, 
I don't like to admit this, but it's easy for us to think the same thing. Think about this for a second. We tend to make up these categories where, um, of, of things like this. Well, there's these people that God really cares about. And you know what they tend to be? People like us. People that dress like us, who like the same kind of music as us, who um, smell like us, comb their hair like us, you know, all those things you can say. And then there are all those people that don't, that, that, that God doesn't really care about. And they smell different, they look different, they do things different. And listen to me, that is a dangerous dangerous mindset. It's dangerous, right? It causes us not to share the gospel. And the reason is people must not matter to God then. And if people don't matter to God, why should we get all worked up about it? Right? And let me tell you this. This kind of thinking is nothing new. In fact, Jesus dealt with it all the time. One of the central themes of Jesus' ministry was straightening people out. And, and you, we've, we've studied this in length, and so I'm not going to give you the whole thing, but I want to give you, in Luke 15, uh, this happened. And Jesus wants to f- challenge the people that were around him, their view of, of people outside the family of God. Here's what, he's, here's what happened. So Luke 15, verse 1 says, Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to him, talking about Jesus, to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners, and he eats with them. Can you believe it? So one day Jesus was teaching, and suddenly he's surrounded by an irreligious crowd of people, people that were sinners, real sinners, not the church people sinners, right? And it was a bunch of creasters. It was a bunch of undesirers and sinners. And they come to Jesus, people that, Certainly, the religious people thought didn't, God didn't have any use for. And these people were saying that Jesus claimed to be from God, but look what he's doing. He's hanging out with these people. And Jesus, by the way, is never fooled. He knows what people are thinking, so you can't even think something that God doesn't know. And so he moves, his, he moves over the people over to this crowd, and he, he proceeds to tell them three stories. The first one's like this, and you'll know it. Once there was a shepherd, and he owned 100 sheep, and one of those little furry critters ran off. So the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes on a search and finds the the sheep. And once he's found it, he puts it on his shoulders, and he brings it back to the 100. Then he calls all his shepherd homies, and he has a party. He waits for a second, and then he says, story number two. It says, once there was this woman who had 10 coins, and as she's counting her 10 coins, one of them falls out of her hand and it rolls away. And so she loses it. So she turns on the lights, she sweeps the whole place, she turns over all the furniture till she finds that coin. And when she finds the coin, she gets on her cell phone and she calls all her friends and they have a big party. So Jesus pauses for a second, he says, I don't know if they're getting it. Let me do another one. He says, there was once a man and he had two sons. The younger one got a little cocky. He thought he was grown up, thought he knew it all, and he wanted to taste the wild side of life. So he asked his dad for his inheritance. And his dad gives him his inheritance and he runs off to a distant country where he spends all his money, gets gets a few friends, they hang out with him, But soon, his money runs out, and so does his friends, because those kind of friends never stay very long. And he finds himself hungry and broke, and he has to feed pigs. And then after, and then he gets so hungry that he starts eating with the pigs. And he thinks in his mind, he goes, you know what? In my dad's house, the servants eat better than I'm eating right now. I'll just go back and try to go uh, be a servant at my dad's house. And so he takes off. The scripture says, Jesus says, home. And his father every day is waiting for his son to come. He's looking every day, looking for his son. And finally, on a long way off, he sees his son and he runs to him, the Bible says, and he embraced him. 
And the son says to his dad, shh, I've made an awful mistake. And his dad's like, shh, be quiet. None of that talk right now. Come on in. Where's his robe? Where's his ring? We're throwing a party. Ain't got time for any of that, son. And he throws a party. And I think Jesus looked into the eyes to all of those religious people after he finished that third story. He thought, good, well, that ought to make an impression on those folks. See, that's the only time in the scriptures that three parables were told in a row. Generally, what would happen, Jesus would hear a miss understanding and he would tell a story to try to explain God's view of it. Then he'd go on to another area, but not this time. Jesus was so upset at the conversation that was going on between the religious leaders about who matters to God and who doesn't that Jesus says, I'm going to clear this up once and for all. And there's some common threads that I just want to point out real quick and then we'll move on. First one is there's something missing and it's of great value. So much so that the shepherd... Uh, the, the, the sheep to the shepherd, the, the coin to the woman, and the son to the, the man. And Jesus' listeners, when they heard that, some of them began to grasp the fact that God loves them. Right? And, and they're like, wait a minute. Could it be that God cares about me, even though I've messed up so much? And when Jesus' listeners put it all together, they were, they were just crushed by God's love. And here's the truth again. People matter to God. Amen? People matter to God. It doesn't matter your race, your gender, your level of education, your pay grade. Everyone matters to God. You say, okay, but how much do people matter? Well, so much so that it caused a search. If you look at these stories, the thing that was lost was so important, they go out and they search for it. The, the shepherd to the sheep, the woman to the coin, and when something of uh, value ends up lost, they go after a search for it. Now, the third threat, threat of these three stories is this, and I just want to give it to you. When the thing that's lost is found, they throw a party. Do you see that? The shepherd does, the woman does, and the man does. The father throws the biggest party of all. And you know, I thought about this. You know, I remember when I was saved. I was, a ju- I was going into my junior year of high school. I was at a centrifuge. And I remember listening to that preacher talk, and I remember what he said. I don't remember all of it, but he he asked a question. If you died tonight, where would you spend eternity? Well, I knew I wouldn't spend eternity with God. So I got on my knees that night, and I prayed, and I asked Christ into my life. And I started thinking about that. You know, I asked for forgiveness. And you know what Jesus said happened when I did that? Here's Here's what he says, verse 10. I tell you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You know what that means? There was a party for me, right? And when that dawned on me, I was thinking, you know what? God must really care about me. And not only does he care about me, but he cares about everyone. You know, when you got saved, God threw a party, right? People matter to God. You think about this. Lost people matter. To God. People in this town matter to God. People with messed up lives, people who have made sexually wrong decisions matter to God. People who have made relationally bad decisions matter to God. I can go on and on. People who messed up their life with substance abuse matter to God, right? Republicans and Democrats. Matter to God. Liberals and conservatives, both of them matter to God. And the reason why I bring that up, depending on what side of the the aisle you're on, we look at the other side and say, oh, they're just dirt bags. Right? It's what we do in this country today. You know what Jesus, he doesn't look at either one of those. He says, these people matter to me. Liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican, doesn't matter. People that live right next door to you matter to God. And I know you're sleepy. And I know that you hear me every week go on, but I'm telling you, this is important. One one preacher said this. He said, there's not a person that you've ever looked into their eyes, that you've ever locked eyes on, that isn't valuable to God and he not care about. Right? 
And I pray that, th that you will come to grips with that. Right? Because the truth is people are lost and God cares for lost people. And you know, you may be here and you may be wondering, does God really care about me? Am I loved by God? Maybe you've messed up and I'll just tell you right now, God does. He loves you. He died for you. He died so you could be forgiven. He wants to save you. And maybe this morning, you're here and you're a Christian already, but you need to get a new perspective. You need to embrace the fact, these facts that God loves lost people and begin to live your life in light of that truth. Because maybe if we're honest, we don't see lost people. We just see someone that annoys us. Right? And I know, does anybody annoy anybody here? You ever get annoyed with some of the people, coworkers, whatever? Yeah, I get annoyed with you, Joe. Yeah, well, good. I know I, know I annoy somebody. Now, here's my thing. Maybe you don't care, or maybe you're indifferent, but we can't stay there as a church. I refuse to stay there. I want to show you a picture this morning. Go ahead and put the very first picture up. See if you can see it. Okay, well, let me just explain it to you. Some of you will know, because most of you may remember, if you're my age or older, you've seen this picture. Um, I was reminded of the picture uh, this couple weeks ago. The kids went to Passion, and Tim Tebow was uh, talking, and he showed this picture. And it, it was, uh, it's, it's a very moving picture. It was taken by a guy by the name of Kevin Carter. Maybe you remember that name. He was an American uh, photographer, and he was, he was in the Sudan in 1993. And they were having a severe famine in the land in Africa. And he was there to kind of chronicle it. He was taking pictures and he wanted to stir people up a little bit. Well, he's also the same guy that was in the 80s and so forth, was all over Africa uh, taking pictures of apartheid. So he had documented a lot of different things over the years. So he's in Sudan when he took this picture. And the photo, just let me re remind you, if you, you've probably seen it. The photo of, is of a starving Sudanese child, right, who's struggling to reach the food center, um, was walking and, and, and has fell over and is on the ground, you know, just was too weak to get to the food center. Right behind the child was a vulture that had, had landed about five feet behind the child. Um, so the picture won a Pulitzer Prize for best picture. It was listed as one of the 100. You can Google this. You'll find it. It's real easy to find. The picture first appeared in the New York Times in 93, and it ignited a firestorm. People that were condemning the picture and people that were congratulating the guy for taking the picture. A lot of people were upset uh, at, the, at the photographer he was, they were like, what are you doing taking a picture of this, right? You're not helping the child. You're just taking a picture, they said. And eventually, uh, after all the uh, hubbub of this, uh, Carter, the, the guy that took the picture, admitted that he had watched the scene for about 20 minutes of this child uh, laying there in the dirt and the, and the vulture uh, be, behind it, uh, the, the child, and, and he was hoping that the vulture would get a, kind of move closer and spread its wings so he could get a more dramatic picture. After the, the vulture decided that he wasn't going to move any further, um, Kevin Carter um, shooed the, the bird off. And then he left. But he left the child there in the dirt. He was questioned over and over again about his lack of doing anything in that picture. And it got to him so much, he couldn't take it anymore. So he took a garden hose and he stuck in his, um, in what do you call it, the tailpipe of his car. He stuck the, the garden hose and he took the other end of it and stuck it in his car and he rolled all the windows up and he killed himself. He, he couldn't take the fact that he decided against doing anything you know, and I thought about this. That's bad. That, that really is bad. It's, you know, 
we don't like to, if you could see the picture, has anybody, anybody seen that picture? You know what I'm talking about? Google it, you'll find it. That's bad, but listen to me. All around town, all around this place, there are lost people, and if they die, I want you to hear this, if they die, they're eternally, forever going to spend eternity in hell. Right? And they're in dire need just as much as that child was. And I don't downplay that a bit. And my question to you this morning is, do we care? Do we care? Right? What are we going to do about it? Lost people are all around us. See, God is calling this church into coin. Right? To make disciples. To reach out to other people. And my question is, will you do it? Will you do it? I said, well, Joe, all my friends are Christians. Will you start praying for somebody? We're going to talk uh, more about later about, I man, God putting somebody on your heart, maybe a neighbor or something, and you be in prayer for them. It's called Who's Your One? We'll be talking about it later. But I'm asking you, will you pray for that person? L- let me tell you this. I'll give you a promise. Some of you need to hear this. I'll give you a promise. Sometimes it's real hard as a pastor. You get off track a little bit and you start thinking other things matter and you hear some people talking and that's the most important thing is that we reach people for Jesus. And let me tell you this. When you get to the end, ain't nobody going to care about what you got on, what the, what the carpet looked like, what, you know what they're gonna, you're going to care about and what God's going to care about? Who'd you bring with you? And he, he's either going to say, good, well done, my good and faithful servant, or he's not. And that's all you're going to care about. And if you think that I just, I said this in the first service too, because I believe this to my gut. And as a church, we are going and we're going to reach this community. That's where we're headed. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning. And Lord, it's so easy to get distracted off what the goal is. God, you care about people and you want us to reach you want us to reach the coin. That's why you put us here. God, and I do not want you to take our, our lampstand away. God, you've been, there's, there's other churches that their lampstand is no longer lit. God, and we got to get back to the basics. Help us, Lord Jesus. God, I pray that you'll help us um, Sometimes we got to hear hard things, and, and Lord, sometimes it takes a, a brick upside my head to hear what you're telling me. Lord, and there's other people in here, Lord, they're just like me, and they need to hear. Help us, Lord Jesus. Create a desire in our heart to reach people. We ask this in your name. Amen. So I'm going to ask you, if you would, to stand with me. As we come to this invitation time, I pray that God lays on your heart, maybe somebody, a neighbor, a friend, a co-worker, that maybe he's leading you to, that you can begin praying for. So as we, as we go to this invitation time, you, you pray, maybe, maybe God, ask God to lay someone on your heart. So as we sing, you do what God's leading you to do. Maybe you're here and you need to accept it.
Well, amen. I know, hey, that's a hard word. That's a hard word to hear. But guys, I really believe this is where we got to go. We need to hear this. We got to be shaken up. Otherwise, you know what the devil does? He, he blinds people to the reality. We don't want that. So let's all pray as we're praying for our church on Tuesdays or wherever. Pray, pray that God wakes us up and that we, we start reaching people more and more for him. God bless you. I pray that you have a great afternoon. I think Gary's going to come and close us out now. Love to have you back tonight, 6 o'clock, if you can come, uh, as we begin love and respect. Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the honor of coming to your church, Lord, to hear your word, Lord. We ask that, Lord, that in the coming week, Lord, just that you, we have the opportunity, Lord, to the neighbor, a friend, that we can give us the courage and the honor of sharing your faith with that person, Lord, and just tell him about you, Lord. We just, we just pray that you give us that opportunity and we just have the courage to do that. Again, we thank you for the many blessings you give us daily, Lord. We know you're always there for us. We praise you and honor your mighty name. Amen.